Hello, my name's Thad Beckham, and welcome to my world of primitive archery. My family's been doing DNA testing now for about 10 years, I guess. Uh, my first family member 10 years ago did a Y test. But we've done Y test, mitochondrial test, uh, autosomal test, and uh, recently we've done a super Y test, which almost an experimental type test. It's very expensive. Um, any test runs anywhere for six or $700. Um, but it was very cool, and what we learned was astonishing. I was really surprised, but it actually showed our family um, proving that the M3 line split, and we was actually given our own subclade haplogroup, and uh, the two lines of my family are the only people in the world that belong to this haplogroup, uh, American Indian haplogroup, which is unbelievable. I'm mostly um, European, um, through DNA, but I do have several lines of Native American through males. And um, the astonishing thing about this uh, DNA test, it showed us actually migrating and more than likely being of the Sioux and Catawban people. Okay, it's my belief that these arrows were used in conjunction with the fish poisons. Here in the southeast, we had the black walnut, the outer shell, the black walnut, the green shell the hickory nut, the um, bear grass root, we had the pokeweed berries, we had the buckeye bush, a lot of different poisons used. And you know that's illegal today to use fish poison so don't do it. Uh, we are going to show uh, these arrows in use but we'll be shooting bullfrogs. Scott Jones had reminded me of a book and a technique to make Catawba fishing arrows. The book was written in 1946. Uh, John Swanton's book, Indians of the Southeast United States. And in there it describes making these cane arrows from green material. This arrow is made in 10 minutes with that method. Um, the forks cut in, done with stone tools, hand straightened, not over fire, the cane's green. And no feathers, just a knock in the end. The reason for this is to retain the weight to it so it'll penetrate deeper in the water. I had forgot about, I had read that book many years ago and have forgot about that. And thanks Scott for reminding me. If you're going to cut cane and dry it so you can straighten it with heat, uh, you need to let your cane dry a couple months. I mean, I usually do. You see I got some uh, arrow material here, right beside me here, and um, I'm going to make some really lightweight arrows from this material, but I will let it dry for, you know, six, eight weeks, and then I can straighten it with heat. But this arrow was not done that way. This is a green cane arrow. Let's shoot it. There's my plastic fish. You know, shooting uh, fish with an arrow like this was a short range thing. Let's see if we can hit our plastic fish. At this range, it's completely accurate and a complete success. Uh, most of the knowledge, Native American knowledge, was lost. Uh, I like to experiment. I like to relearn. Uh, the books like Swanton's book written in 1946 are great, but it does not contain everything in there that native people done. I'm going to make some Catawba arrows out of dried cane so I can straighten them and make them more accurate and um, spend a little more time with wraps and feathers and that kind of thing. Um, you know, we can't say it wasn't done, like I say, 2% of the knowledge was retained. 98% of the knowledge was evaporated and lost. So, you know, that's why I do what I do. I've always been amazed and fascinated by the skills of the Native Americans. And a lot of that is us relearning what's been forgotten, unfortunately. But that's where we're at. That's what I do. That's why I do what I do.
Okay, what I've got is a deer, a deer hide string which has been tremendously strong, a piece of oak stained with pokeberry. I've had this thing forever and this string's lasted forever. Eastern red cedar for the uh, drill and the heart. A piece of deer antler I've had for decades making fire with it. Unbelievable. Uh, just good, durable stuff. You build it right, it'll stay with you a long time. And uh, uh, I love making fire in the summer. Woohoo! nearly 60 years old is still making fire in the summer. Whew. We got an ember. Let's light our fire then we can straighten our arrow. Okay, we got fire. Just the tip of it and kind of rough it up. Leave it rough. That way to grip when it goes in the in the uh, fish. Uh, the fiber you wrap behind it's going to help it grip if it goes that deep, and it may. Um, it'll keep it from coming back out. So you can cut little grooves in it if you want, but roughing it up's enough. You just don't want the cane to be, you know, slick. And it is slick, so I take the skin off a little bit right in here and just kind of. Just kind of score it up a bit and make it rough, but not enough to make it weak. Okay, all the work's done. My arrows are ready to use. So guess what? Let's go use them. Okay, I wanted to show these arrows actually being used on a fish. So I caught a fish legally. And uh, by the way, I eat this fish, but I had to put air back in the fish because the fish uh, bladder had decompressed. So I took a river cane reed and blew the fish up, made a fish balloon so the fish would float and simulate one being poisoned on the surface. And then I could determine through shooting the fish with the Catawba arrow, uh, would the point actually spread or would it just slow the penetration of the arrow so the arrow wouldn't pass through the fish. And now my belief is um, the point was made just to slow the penetration. So that's what happened in actual use. I uh, also took the um, arrow and shot it in about two foot of water just to see how deep it would penetrate and still stick into the firm bottom. And uh, in, at two feet was no problem for this arrow.
Got him, bud. We're gonna eat some frog legs for dinner. It's a nice one, man. Anyway, uh, oh, look at there. Right in his chest, come out. The Catawba arrow just penetrated completely through, so. I was hoping it would have went in and expanded, but I might be shooting too much poundage. I, I did kill a deer with this bow last year, so <laughs> it's not that heavy. It's 49 pounds, and I figure it would work out, but it still got the frog, so. Off to a good start. We off to a good start and uh, having fun. We're going we're gonna to cook some frogs, hopefully. You know, the Catawba arrow, it's not working like I need it to. It's just, oh, it hit a root or something. Boy, it's getting nasty on my arrows. But anyway, Mike, you want the big frog or the small one? <laughs> <laughs> you want to look for another one? Let's do it. Okay. Chase, you're bringing me. Absolutely. And uh, we went through the woods looking for frogs. <laughs> we got in the boat looking for frogs. We had one, the frogs got nervous. Um, we didn't see how many, five? Five. We oh. killed two, missed one, spooked a couple more. But I enjoyed it, Mike. That was fun. And let's make a friction fire and cook our, uh, cook our frogs. How about let's that? I'm hungry. Okay. We got some bullfrog and some beans. And what else, Mike? We got bullfrog and beans. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> We got a can of porky beans and two frog legs a piece. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, that is really good considering it has no spice on it or anything. You reckon there's anybody else in Georgia tonight eating frog killed with Catawba arrows? <laughs> Highly unlikely. <laughs> Tell you what, that frog is delicious. You know, I guess the really great part about this is uh, very little work. You can make them really fast, make them out of green cane, 10 minutes an arrow, and you're out gigging fish. We done proved it can be done here. Uh, no feathers. This is probably the better way to go. It's heavier. It's going to penetrate better. So, um, yeah, in my experiments, if I went to gig fish, Right now in the river, I would do the green cane uh, quickie arrow with no feathers. I believe that's the better route. And it was still accurate within its uh, you know, extended range. So yeah, this is cool.